Yeah. See you in five minutes. Yes. Don't go far or stay close. How will you take it? Okay. Thanks for this first part. That was a quick break. Don't know if you went far. Some of you might be mobile. I still love the fact that somebody was taking out their dog in one of these lectures and mobile listening or whatever you call it. Uh, here we go. Back to the foggy picture of uncertainty. That's, that's where we started the first lecture. So kind of coming back to that now and maybe looking at a bigger picture. And I'm going to come now take you to a more societal level, if you will. And everybody here knows that uncertainty at the moment is a very global thing, thanks to the uh, pandemic and all the repercussions and changes that it's causing us. So we talked about, and the, really the focus of what we, the exercises and the examples and facilitation was really organization or transformation. And many of the, how should I say, the scenarios were that there's an organization having a transformation, digitalization, some kind of a culture. Yeah, sure. That's happening. That is actually a job to do. But can we take one step back in, in, in the onion way of things and look at what's happening in the broader sense? Uh, on a societal level, is there a transformation of work life skills in general? So if many, many organizations are going through a transformation, which they of course are now, thanks to the global situation, doesn't that mean, what does it look like if we take one step back? And kind of taking these, how should I say, polarized views in the organized transformation and thinking at how do they fit in if we look at how many different organizations in society are changing. So on the other hand, we have the Tayloristic old culture, which was very top-down and very uh, siloed, if you will, categorized. The processes were sacred. And on the other hand, we have the lean new culture, where the grassroots take responsibility and, and a lot of autonomy, self-leadership, and so forth and so forth. Well, again, I'm sure many of you are not surprised. One of the most quoted things in the change of work life, change of future skills, is this report from two years ago from World Economic Forum. And it says the over there, the first quote, by 2022, so two years from now, no less than 54% of all employees will require significant re and upskilling. 54, that's more than half of employees on the planet. And I put there that really ugly red thing saying that, and this was pre-corona. So whether you believe this report, uh, it is, you know, um, it's, it's pretty safe to say even under these circumstances that there's an enormous reskilling and upskilling going on, going to happen in the next years. And if you look at what the uh, report said in more detail, and 35% expected to require additional training, 9% uh, take a reskilling, and so forth and so forth. So, and another example I often use is, especially that many of you are university students at the moment. This is a report a few years back, uh, Finnish Foundation, CIPRA. They did a report and a study on what are the work-life skills required for students entering university. Kind of thinking that when they enter the university and they go to the work life. So what are the top five skills that, uh, especially in Finland, but I would say in Western, Western Hemisphere, definitely are required in the work life. And they are continuous upskeep of own skills, constant learning, lifelong learning, whatever you call it. Knowing yourself, self-reflection. Pretty much the whole point of, of the exercise, understanding your skills, understanding who you are and all that. Having an ability to do that. Co-work, collaboration. You know, future is, if, if somebody's still thinking that the future is for those lonely wolves working hard. No, it's not. It required skills of co-work and collaboration. Uh, networking, working with other organizations, putting organizations together, networking with other people, 
And last but not least, entrepreneurship and problem solving approach. Now, sounds pretty familiar after having all these uh, six, seven weeks of facilitation that, yeah, that's kind of a facilitation side taste all of this, if you think about it. And then just to add one more thing uh, from a university and education perspective, I think this is a good example of this is some kind of a center or think tank from, uh, from the US thinking about what is education in the 21st century. And they really emphasize these meta skills. So they actually, if you think about an university education, you have kind of the substance that you learn the mathematics, you learn, uh, let's say, computer uh, hardware engineering, or you learn chemistry engineering, and kind of these substance and you become uh, some kind of an expert. But in on top of that, we have these meta learning skills about knowledge, character, character meaning who we are, uh, how do we develop our mind, and then the actual skills of, of kind of the meta skills of creativity, critical thinking, and so on. Uh, so if we look at from this that, yes, is there a demand for facilitation? Going back and looking at this whole course, that if we're teaching all of this to you, is there actually a demand out there for these kind of skills? I'm pretty sure that everybody here would agree that there is, but is there a, a societal demand? Or facilitation, that it is a bigger thing than one organization. And these digital transformations that many of you are working with, or you know, use as a slogan of, of the change that is happening or the, the word that is pushing the change, is it in the big picture actually a huge skills transformation? Because if we believe that people are getting upskilled and reskilled, we need somebody to make the new experts and the old experts kind of work together. Who is going to facilitate this huge transformation? And who's going to help others to see the big, bigger picture and the long-term impact of this skills transformation? So kind of, again, bringing forth and, and kind of summarizing and bringing again a couple of things that, that you're already familiar uh, in this, what we have been lecturing, but kind of bringing and refreshing your mind. Starting with this dramatic picture, that which is another thing about the, 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 another way of looking at the fog picture is that as we now live in very uncertain times, the future is uncertain for many individuals, many organizations, and in, a large, uh, in large cases, many societies as well. And what we started with in this course was the predictability and Taylorism in other certain times, no, they just explode. They do not work so well because they're pretty much based on predictability. So if we want to really simplify and summarize that how do we change things in an uncertain environment? What is the kind of view which just really easily try to explain that what is the change process in general, whether it's a single project or even smaller single workshop or like a large project or a huge endeavor, it maybe looks something like this. We have a current situation. And on the other hand, we have the desired impact. And because things are uncertain, they're behind the cloud or smoke. There are multiple alternatives. There's not an obvious single solution. That's what unpredictability is about. That's what uncertainty is about. That there is probably many ways to do this, but none of them are obvious. And that's why the Taylorism and the old model doesn't work. Now, if we take this simple model and we a little bit go further, we understand that the fact is that as we start working, that impact changes as well. That the initial desired impact that we started with, actually, you know, we clarify it a little bit. Uh, something happens and the impact changes to a new desired impact. So it's a moving target as well, the desired impact we are doing. And just again, to remind you, if you think about agile working, or if you think about lean startup, or if you think about uncertainty, this is, this is the basic scenario, that you uh, accept that there are multiple alternative ways, and you also accept that the goal, the objective is changing as well. And that's why we have all these methods and tools, but that's why we also are building these organization structures. 
to be able to work in this scenario. Or maybe we're, you know, building societies that are also can work in this scenario as well. But back to the facilitation, if you look at this picture, a couple of things become clear against that old traditional model. There are no clear paths, like I said. But it also means from a skill set, if you think about what kind of work skills we need in an organization, in a team, in a society. In this kind of scenario, it's not that clear. The roles are not clear. The tasks are not predefined as they used to be. And the problem, of course, and the challenge is the objectives shift. They're clarified as we go, as I mentioned. And the other thing that is relatively big when you sit down and think about it is that the actual current situation, wherever you start your small, big, medium-sized project, you need to accept that the skills that you require to get this project done, to get this workshop done, to get this transformation done, are very situational and contextual. You do not necessarily know beforehand what are the skills you need to get this project done because you have multiple alternatives and the impact changes. And again, if you put this against a very traditional model where your organization has, we have engineers and marketing people and these people, it is not situational, it's not contextual, it is predefined. These are the skills that we have and these are the skills that we need. So to summarize this is another question that does it mean that we, to be able to work in a context like this, we need these meta skills. Or you could just, you know, swap facilitation skills. But the meta word I use here, just that these skills are not specific to a certain profession. They're not specific to a certain education. And this is really important when you, when you talk about skills transformation on a societal level. And again, the skills are seeing the big picture, skill to iterate and clarify objectives, you know, skills to have a continuous dialogue about meanings, ability to bring different skills together, ability to facilitate different experts, and the ability to be reflective for self-leadership, well-being. And, uh, this is really the kind of the main point of the skills transformation is that when we are in a very uncertain situation and we are doing a transformation, it really kind of brings forth. They just, these things pop up into the surface due to that situation. And it's another way of looking at what we actually made you do. That, we firmly believe that these little exercises, these little simple tools, have kind of a counterpart in this major skills transformation and in these meta skills or facilitation skills, or, or you could call them leadership skills. So if you now look back at exercise one and two, they were pretty much about seeing the big picture. Exercise three was actually very much about skills to iterate and clarify objectives. Uh, exercise three was also actually a lot about continuous dialogue about meanings. When you help them facilitate the other person to tell you, how is this understandable? How is this measurable? And every time you had to explain to the other person, what is your job? Where do you work? You were actually creating shared meanings. So you could actually do the exercise. And as you can see, all of the exercises, because they were pair exercises, were more or less training you to you know, bring different skills together, training you to facilitate different experts to work together. And this was of course why we randomly matched you together. Just that you kind of face this thing that I have no idea who this person is. We need to create shared meanings. Uh, you know, I have to totally calibrate the way I'm gonna facilitate and, and so forth and so forth. And of course the last one was this, your ability for self-leadership and well-being. So just to remind you, help you put in the context that these were fun exercises, small exercises, but there is, <laughs> there is this bigger thing behind it. Uh, however, danger, danger, high voltage. 
Those gal if you remember a few lectures ago, I had those little uh, characters and the one boss character, these little buttons or what do you call them in English. Uh, this is kind of the same thinking that much of this, these discourses, if you will, uh, the discussion about facilitation, leadership, transformation, everything is full of hype, it is full of fashionable things. So I just, you know, as, as academics, we want to remind you, don't be naive, don't be a populist, don't go where, don't tell and preach things that people want to hear. You need to be critical. And one of the things I want to emphasize is the hazards of self-leadership and autonomy. They are not the, the paradise of work. They are not the end that uh, as long as we have perfect self-leadership and autonomy, everything's perfect. And, uh, <clears throat> and you know, eating my own dog food. So, you know, let's put this picture back here. So if this is the El Dorado, this is the goal that many of the cultural transformations are going. And on a societal level, we can say many of the organizations are changing and transforming into this. We can hear a lot of, I would say, populist and uh, uncritical comments again uh, about this kind of a working culture. You can hear things such as bureaucracy is bad. Uh, in our company, everyone can make decisions themselves. We don't need bosses. Our CEO is the only boss for the whole company. Uh, and you can hear people saying to, let's say somebody just started a new job. Hey, you're the expert. You make the decision. I don't make the decisions. You make the decisions in this company. Or what is another one I could pick? Well, flat hierarchies, revolution again. Let's blow up the silos. And well, one, one of the things that I've heard in many, many companies I've worked with is that, that if you look at the especially the software consultancies, they pretty much say out and loud, and there's nothing wrong about it, that they formed the whole company so there would be no idiot bosses. That's a very good starting point. But what happens after that is be careful for what you wish for. Because a few words about the other side of the coin when it comes to autonomous organizations. And I think this is super important for us as facilitators to understand. Because if we are facilitating organizations to become something that we don't, you know, be careful for what you wish for, what kind of organization are you actually building with your facilitation work? A couple of pointers there, actually three master theses, all of them excellent about this if you want to dig deeper. But I'm going to give a couple of critical points. First is that we hear so very often that let's take away hierarchies. Hierarchies are bad. Uh, they're old. They're the old Tayloristic world. But what happens when you take away hierarchies is that you create invisible hierarchies. And if, you, if somebody introduces you a flat organization with zero hierarchies, then you can start asking questions such as, well, who has the soft power here? If the power, meaning the hierarchies are not visible, then who's calling the shots? who's de facto calling the shots. Is there, what is, how, where does the power come from? Who can influence each others? Or, or who is bold enough to use the autonomy? If we give autonomy and decision power to everybody, do they actually use it? Are they brave enough? Does it work as it was supposed to? So point being, of course, that if you make hierarchies invisible, it doesn't mean that they don't, if you, no, I mean, if you take hierarchies away, it doesn't mean that they go away, they just become invisible. So having a very visible formal structure is good because everybody knows the rules. Everybody knows where to go and what is my work and what is not my work. So a couple of things I added there, I'm not gonna go through, but for example, if we don't have any hierarchies, we just have soft power. Does it mean that the most social person in the organization actually has a lot of power? Because if you're very social and everybody likes you, you actually have power to influence other people. And this is invisible. Social pressure. I like this photo because <laughs> Yari, when he saw this, just totally read it the way. Because these people, you can see, oh, look, they're creating a heart with their hands. Or you can look at this picture and say, wow, they have blood on their hands. 
social pressure is something that always exists, it's just like hierarchies. And if you just say that, you know, everybody is equal and, and we have this amazing culture and everybody's a happy person, well, then I think you are very blind. Because the question is that what these studies showed when these master's thesis workers went to these organizations, you start getting questions like, well, what is normal at our workplace? If everybody is autonomous, if everybody's a leader, everybody's a decision maker, everybody's pushing forward and everybody's just awesome. So uh, what is normal? If nobody tells you that this is the way to work, those are the working hours, then you start looking at the social environment and you start making these predictions. Well, nobody's telling me what is normal work in this organization, so I'm trying to guess. And then you get a thing such as, you know, yeah, you get on Instagram that everybody's posting best pictures of themselves. And, and, you know, meaning that everybody in the organization is showing their best side all of the time. And you're going to think that this is normal. The other question is what is considered success? That comes from, you know, that's a social process. If nobody tells explicitly, this is what success means, then people start looking at different cues and clues what it does it mean. And there becomes this social pressure that we need to maybe be too successful. Moving on, our own beliefs and mental prisons. If nobody, if there's no hierarchies, if everybody's autonomous, everybody's leading themselves, at the end of the day, that thing that is left is what is be between our ears, our own beliefs, our prejudice and mental prisons. You know, everybody, everybody's writing in LinkedIn and I'm passionate about this and this in my work. Well, am I passionate enough? You know, <laughs> what does passion mean to me? I believe that I should be more passionate about ERP systems because I work with ERP or something like that. And what is enough success for me? And these things are often our own, I provocatively call them mental prisons. Where do I draw the line? What is enough for me if nobody's telling me from the outside? So again, the answer of course is to start looking at structures that autonomous work is not bad as such, but it cannot be uncontrolled. That is, I would call irresponsible leadership. And a couple of things that, that have come up in this lecture about, you know, handling autonomous and self-leadership is shared meanings. What is work for us? Let's discuss. What does it success? You know, let's have a meaningful conversation. What are the borders and boundaries that we need? What are the hierarchies that we want to build? What are the roles and responsibilities we have here? So that people can work in peace and not all the time trying to figure out what is expected of me? What is success? What is my, what's my role now? And of course, being aware of you know, bewaring of individualism, which which you know, that's where we live in in many cultures, that we really appreciate the individual. But if you work for an organization, the simple point is a collective effort. So how much people do bring themselves forth rather than you know just working for the team. And this is in many ways for us facilitators important to understand. And the number one question is this: what I put here. Have you actually sat down and thought that what kind of organization are you creating through your facilitation? If you have years and years and worked for to teams to be autonomous and individuals to have a lot of self-leadership, have you actually sat down and thought that what does the world look like if everything happens precisely like that without you know, any critical thinking? Then, my final point, uh, before we have another quick breakout. And now going back to facilitation. Facil you as a facilitator, you as the leader, change manager, change leader, change agent, what do you call it? And just reminding everybody that it's heavy work. It is for many, many reasons that we have discussed there's a lot of self-reflection going on and, and you know, social calibration and, and all that. Because as you kind of from the previous point you got, it is actually very autonomous and independent work, which means that it is mentally very ta uh, taxing. So 
Because one of the question is, if we go back to the organization transformation, that what can actually an individual person do? Every one of you there is an individual person. And every one of you are, you know, in some cases, a facilitator or a change agent. Many of you are, you know, extremely uh, experienced professionals in this. But that if then is there, what can a one person do if you have a large organization to change? And the reason I have penguins here is that I love this, um, I think it's an American phrase about the first penguin. So supposedly penguins work like this uh, in the picture, that they stand next to the, uh, on an ice, uh, on, on the ice next to the ocean, and they see that there's fish out there. But they don't know if there's an actually a killer whale as well, somebody who would eat them. So everybody's standing there and just waiting. But eventually, one of the penguins decides that they will jump and take the risk. And when the first penguin jumps, everybody else kind of goes like, yeah, let's see. Ah, OK, he survived. And then boom, just everybody jumps and eats the fish. So in a way, the job of a change leader, agent, facilitator, you are the first penguin. You will find yourself in a situation where you are the first penguin. Everybody else is looking at what will the facilitator do? How do they take control? How does the leader work here? And then when, you know, when the killer whale doesn't eat you, they're like, oh, okay, I'll try this tool. Oh, okay, I'll start working like this and so forth. A couple of things to work in this situation. How do you do that? It's of course, just like that penguin in the picture. You need to show by example, you need to jump. A couple of things I brought up here, you know, the simple things again. Six times six, six times one feedback means that you know give six times positive feedback to every critical feedback. Uh, in a meeting, be the first one to stand up. Everybody's sitting on a table, and you know somebody should go to the whiteboard and you know be that person. You always want oh yeah yeah let me draw this. And uh, you know if you're really important to talk the customer's language and not your company's internal jargon, then then do that. Start talking customer language. But also other things, have fun, it's contagious. If you're having fun and enjoying your time, people see that and you know they start having fun as well. They're jumping into the ocean as well. And try out new things and fail once in a while. And this is true for you even if you're just a junior facilitator or a big, big leader. And then of course, you know, demand, talk. Try to persuade people, encourage and appreciate when people change. If your job is to be the facilitator of change, then recognize other people. Go like, hey, actually, yeah, you know what? That was amazing what you did in that project. I really appreciate that. You're doing, you know, what everybody wishes that the whole company is doing. Beware of populism, though. Uh, you know, snake oil salesmen uh, are in this, in this world as well. But don't forget, don't fool yourself for a second that this kind of a change agent job is not the easiest job on the planet. You could choose to be, you could choose an easier path. Make no mistake. Uh, which means that if you choose this path, if you want to be the first penguin to jump, you need to be very aware that you actually give yourself slack, you know, Calibrate those success factors for yourself. Put them down. Give yourself an extra vacation. And when you see other people jumping into the cold waters, you know, support them. And let other people help you as well. Choose your battles. If you're changing an organization, you don't have to change everything. You don't have to change everybody. Choose where you put your energy. Yeah, that workshop is important because A, B, or C, well, that workshop, well, I think I'll ask somebody else to do it because I'm gonna take an extra vacation day because I'm exhausted or something like that. And you need to be very conscious about your own well-being, mental well-being, your recovery. Uh, how do you recover from you know, a week sprint? If any of you have ever done a week sprint where you have been the facilitator running it, that is extremely exhausting to do five days in a row or even two weeks, uh, you need to really start planning your mental well-being in those situations. 
And importantly, again, have fun. Otherwise, it's just too hard. I had an old colleague of mine who was working for a media company here in Finland, and he was kind of hired as a change leader to bring new business ideas and create new business for that media company. And he said, he said it kind of funnily, he said, banging your head against the brick wall hurts. But if you're not having fun while banging your head against the brick wall, it hurts even more. <laughs> anyway, he had chosen that path. It wasn't the easiest path to go to a large media company and come up with new businesses, but he chose that and was very successful. But he said that you need to have fun. So to kind of wrap it up, one person can of course change your immediate surroundings. That is doable. Your immediate surroundings might be your team, uh, your colleagues, you can convince them. It's not easy, uh, but it is doable. But make no mistake that when you start, you know, adding layers to the onion, uh, it's not going to be easy. Maybe this is something for, you know, people who haven't really done much of this yet. It sounds very easy and you get these tools, but of course it is not easy. It is very difficult, although often very, very rewarding. And you know, the rewards could be that you do something for two years and then you decide to quit because nothing happens. And then you meet somebody after the third year and they're like, yeah, now things are happening. So that might be rewarding. So things take time. The larger the transformation, the larger the time that it takes. And, and if you may, you know, as a, as a 40 plus person and, and working a lot with people who are in their 20s, Sometimes I feel that young people, they want immediate rewards. They want immediately to see the results and the impact and everything. But if you're going for the long run, you're building a startup or, or working for a large corporation to do change, it doesn't really happen that fast. And you need to be able to understand that these rewards take time. Christo. Yes. Someone is asking during the chat about populism. What do you mean by that? What do I mean by populism? I mean, uh, by populism in this context, I mean simply that telling people what they want to hear and not being critical about it. If you see people in an organization who are kind of grumpy, I hate the bosses, I hate the hierarchy, you know, decision making is so slow, a populist would come and tell them, hey, you know what, there's a better world, you know, let's, let's, Let's create an organization with no hierarchies and we'll, we'll have no bosses at least and, and everybody can make decisions. And then you can imagine people go, yeah, yeah, hey, that's a great idea. Let's go and form that company. I'm going to quit and we're going to do that company. And at the end of the day, what you end up doing is invisible hierarchies and, and you know, decision making based on social pressure and so forth and so forth. And you actually get a lot of problems with people's uh, mental well-being, to put it very bluntly. So populism, in all simplicity, means telling people what they want to hear, not really you know, telling people that, well, the world is a bit complex, there's no black and white. <laughs> that was a populist answer to the word of populism. Okay, next breakout. <gasps> yeah, breakouts, you love breakouts, yeah. If I can hear you, everybody go, yeah. So just very simply, roughly 10 minutes, uh, Simple question. Again, you just had a break room about what did you learn and uh, what did you found useful and all of that. Now, look into the future. This course ends pretty soon. Uh, how, what will you do next week? Is, is there something next week that you will start doing? Change your behavior? Is there something you will do next month? Is there maybe a long-term goal that, you know, yeah, I really started thinking that by Christmas I'm going to actually you know, change my behavior this and this way. So, roughly 10 minutes. Got it? Large groups. Large groups. Larger groups. There was a few two-person groups. Yeah, so sorry about that. Sure that each will have opportunity. And remember, don't panic about these. Welcome back. No, not yet. I forgot that there's this 10-second. Uh, and you have to... Put the mic on. I put the mic on, yeah.
Okay, now everybody is back. Mm. And like I said in the chat, please, you know, just write, write one thing, every one of you. I think it is, again, as we're going to share them, well, you can see them now in the chat, or we're going to share them eventually afterwards. You can, you know, what did other people say? And uh, looking at the exercises and the feedback we get, and I, you are actually appreciating, you know, these peer comments a lot. And uh, that is absolutely one of the things here. Uh, so getting there, don't run away. Don't run away yet. We're going to now closing and wrapping up things, but uh, uh, unless you're running and listening to this while you're running, but yeah, anyway. A couple of points. First of all, everything here is public, <laughs> all the material that we did. So I really, really encourage you, whatever you do for your living, you know, use the stuff, modify it, adapt it, you know, take the videos and, and share them, use them in your facilitation, use them in the trainings or, or whatever. If you're a freelance workshopper, then, you know, take everything and become a millionaire using the stuff. We would be happy. That's the whole point why we put them in the internet. Just use this material. That's why they are there. And uh, we're, as like I said, gradually we're, we're going to add maybe little things into the materials like these chats and everything so you can actually go back and maybe get some inspiration and ideas into your own facilitation task and reminding yourself what's going on. And to add kind of a, as a bonus, uh, I talk with these companies you can see here in the, in, down there, uh, great people I know in these companies and ask that, you know, we have this course, Are, do you have any free resources? Do you have free tools or free something that you can share in this context? Because thanks to this pandemic, there's transformation ahead. Organizations need to change. There is need for facilitation. And all of these companies have done a lot of you know, pioneering work, uh, especially here in Finland, but many of them are bigger than Finland as well. So have a look. We put a special blog post into the Medium where you actually get links to all of these tools, their webinars, tools, books, and so forth and so forth. Uh, free material, nevertheless. So in the spirit of sharing everything for all of us who need to transform organizations and businesses, here's even more stuff to look into. Uh, and then a bonus lesson you learned. So you remember when we promised that we were kind of almost caught by surprise that we need to do this course online. Uh, but I think one of the things that we actually learn about, Yari, what did you learn about online facilitation after this course, doing this course? Uh, well, I, I have to confess that I, I, had, a, I had great doubts uh, in, in the beginning or, or when, when this corona uh, time started that we had to go online overnight. And uh, I'm, I'm so deeply face-to-face -face person and, and my pedagogy is based on what's really face-to-face uh, -face, face sessions. And uh, I'm, I'm surprised how well, based on your feedback and uh, and and this this uh, whole thing that that it, it has it has pretty much worked, and and I'm I'm really encouraged, and thanks for inviting me to join this course, and and thanks for all you, all you guys there online that you have done the exercises and shared the experiences and 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 all what what you have now shared. As your next steps looks great, and uh, and it is really encouraged and boost us to 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 develop further our our education online, and uh, and, and also face to face, of course. But but it's really this mixed mixed world. Mm. I have to say, I was also very kind of I'm gonna say skeptical, but I was worried that this course has been done. All the exercises have been face to face. So how do we do this? But I'm you know positively surprised, and think I think this is something for. I'm sure that you have noticed this as well, that if you're in your job, you need to prepare, you need to do online facilitation this spring, this summer, and you need to be ready to continue for the next fall, maybe next winter as well. So I guess one of the things we want to emphasize is that from the teacher's perspective, or you know, you can think of us as like the facilitators mm -hmm. of you, mm -hmm. uh, this works really well. Mm -hmm. If you just put people into pairs, it starts working. I'm not sure. You, well, you have the experience. How did the breakout rooms work, where you have, were more than a pair? 
and you know think about that but they seem to work again based on the feedback they yeah. seem to work yeah. really yeah. really well indeed, indeed. But the thing with for us teachers is that we don't know what's going on. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. All of my life I've been facilitating so that I can, you know, go and hover around the table and, you know, listen, what are they doing? I have no idea what you are doing. And that's, you know, that's an uncomfort zone for me. And, and this was really nice to also learn that, that this pairing, that in each exercise you had a new person or, or new persons to, to work with, so that it started gradually working well that 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 you you really uh, end up end up uh, meeting uh, different people and uh, and gave, gave a big credit for that that opportunity and so that that's that's really nice and and here that that the students and and more experienced people from working life were sharing the experiences and it, that that this kind of uh, pair work uh, functioned pretty well mm. in that sense. According to your feedback, it did. Mm. Uh, oops, wrong way. Now there's a bonus exercise for those. Uh, we're not going to spend much time about this. Uh, but the point is that if you want two more extra credits as a student or you know even as an active participant, that's possible. And this is an exercise you do over the summer. Uh, you can check it out in detail. Here it is. But you can check it out later when we put the slides online. Uh, pretty much the most important thing is right there where there's this blue color. But if you want to do the extra credit, please pre-register in a week uh, using the email address for this course. So then we know who you are. Or if there's zero of you, then of course we don't, know, don't do anything. If there's again uh, 500 of you, then we are in trouble. Uh, but nevertheless, pre-register if you want those two extra credits. Otherwise, this is three credits, as you remember. And who are we? Who are you? <gasps> so last thing we asking you is turn on your video. Let's have this massive, you know, portrayal of faces. Uh, who are you? Let's see. <laughs> There's so many of you, five pages. I need to change pages. Yeah, yeah it's pretty fun. The cat, I can see the cat. Hey, somebody having palm trees. That's not fair. There is a yeah, person, Anni is walking. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> For that. And a lot of people who don't, for reason or another, have their videos on. Hey, that was pretty cool. Yeah, indeed. There are real people. It's very nice there. to see faces. <laughs> it's great. We never knew if you're all bots or not. Uh, nice to see you. That was it. And, you know, the other one was that. Feel free to write, you know, any additional feelings, anything about the whole course in the chat now, uh, because we are getting there to be done. Yes. Again, all tools and resources are there in the Medium pages. Next week, it's your responsibility. <laughs> We're not going to tell you what to do. And, uh, and now Ona will send, or maybe Ona, you have already sent an email to all of you where there's a uh, Google form. So please, 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 please answer that. Yes, because this was sort of experiment as, uh, from our, our side. So this is not ready. There's a lot of things to be improved. So please give us give us hints and, and, and ideas how to improve this this experience and this kind of course. We, we really love to get, get all, all the feedback. And put your regards, appreciation, thanks to chat and uh, mark your participation as well. Don't forget that. Good. But thanks on our behalf. It has been great to be with you here. And, and, and thanks, Rista, once, once again. It's been great. Thank you. Likewise. <laughs> this was a good okay. experiment. And wish you all nice summer and uh, nice continuation uh, for your facilitation and your learning. Good. Thank you. And thank you, Ona, there in the background. Yeah, thank pulling you. Pulling strings and, and running a lot of exercises mm -hmm. and emails. Mm -hmm. Answer the poll. We will email you if we don't get enough answers. Yeah, indeed. That's our threat. We will okay. Spam you. <laughs> okay. We'll put bye -bye. that video mode back there. Yeah. Have a good summer. Bye bye.